Hello, and welcome to our session on a summary of classical and quantum distributions. This material is found in the appendix of chapter 7. The uh, chapter is titled, I believe it's titled Non-Equilibrium. And we're going to be looking at five separate distributions, two classical, three quantum, but they all have one thing in common. They all have terms of the form of equation A7.1. Um, e, Muller's constant, minus energy divided by energy. This is a unitless uh, quantity. And even though it was derived before the advent of quantum mechanics, it still is present in the quantum mechanical distributions, as we shall see. Okay, so the key difference between the classical and the quantum mechanical is, as we mentioned in the appendix to chapter three, that's a long appendix, but uh, it's kind of a summary of statistical mechanics. Classical particles are identical and distinguishable. Distinguishable uh, not by their properties, they can all be exactly the same, but they're distinguishable by their position and or velocity. Whereas quantum particles are not only identical, but they are indistinguishable. You cannot tell them apart. And that's because Heisenberg tells us that in the quantum world, uh, position and velocity are smeared out. All of these distributions, however, have this, uh, this really wonderful uh, Boltzmann term. Okay, so let's first look at the classical distributions. We're going to be looking at the pressure and the number density of particles as a function of height above sea level. This was actually derived first in chapter one before we uh, knew too much about uh, the probabilistic aspects of it. So we're going to go back. We're not going to rederive it uh, because it's already done. All, in fact, all of the uh, distributions have already been derived. So we're not going to derive anything here, uh, except we will uh, do a little bit of derivation uh, when we talk about uh, distribution two, uh, which is the uh, particle velocities in a balloon. Uh, the three uh, quantum distributions, we're going to be talking about the number of electrons in the conduction band of an n-type, could have done a p-type, either n or p-type, silicon as a function of doping. Again, we're just going to state that because it's already been derived. Uh, the fourth one is the intrinsic carrier concentration of the electron hole pairs as a function of eg, the band gap of the semiconductor. And last but not least, uh, we'll be talking about the intrinsic carrier distribution, how the electrical uh, or the electrons are distributed in the conduction band. Are they all bunched up at one point? Are they distributed in a uniform manner? Um, and we'll find that the intrinsic carrier distribution in the conduction band, or we could have used also a valence band for holes, but um, the um, uh, distribution of electrons in the conduction band is follows the same general form as the distribution of particle velocities of air molecules in a balloon. So there's quite a bit of similarity. And I should mention this has also been derived, although we're going to you know, look at it in quite a bit more detail in uh, in this section. Uh, this is a little bit of a um, uh, correction here. I'd like to say this is, we should say the electron uh, distribution rather than the intrinsic uh, carrier distribution. So I'll correct that because you could have uh, distribution in the uh, a doped semiconductor. In fact, it generally is a doped semiconductor. Okay, so the first uh, of the distributions <clears throat> will be air molecules in the atmosphere. And air molecules in the atmosphere are uh, guided by gravity and by temperature. And there's the interplay between the two. If it was only gravity, 
and there was no temperature, every all the air particles would fall to the ground. And of course, we'd be in a lot of trouble. There'd be no atmosphere at all. And we think that probably happens at about absolute temperature, but uh, hopefully we'll never have to test that. Uh, we'll test that theory. Although uh, we do have a situation called uh, Bose-Einstein condensation, where you can have a similar phenomena in, uh, in photons, but only at temperatures very, very close to, uh, to absolute zero. Okay, so we begin again with our general formulation. And here, that's all there is to it. We're not going to have any other terms uh, like we'll have in some of the other uh, distributions. Uh, the energy here is gravitational energy. And that's why we indicated that in equation A7.2. And we can write that as pressure equals some ground state pressure, which we call P0. And the gravitational energy is, of course, just MGY. And the units of MGY are indeed joules. Force Mg times Y, which is uh, position or distance. Force times distance is energy. Uh, now we notice that this is unitless. This, this term, the Boltzmann term, is always unitless. So we have on the left side, the uh, units are newtons per square meter or per square centimeter, as the case may be. And um, the units on the right side are also uh, the units of pressure, which are newtons per square meter. Okay, so that's what we say here. Uh, the units uh, also for pressure uh, can be written as tor. 760 tor is uh, atmosphere at ground level, or pascal. And one pascal, it's a scientific unit, is one newton per meter squared. Uh, so that um, the um, pressure unit in pascal at sea level is about 10 to the fifth. Okay, so this is basically a rehash of the work that we did in uh, chapter one. We want to find approximately the height of the atmosphere. So this is arbitrary. We just said P divided by P zero, and we arbitrarily say, well, e to the minus one, because it's a nice, easy mathematical value, and that gives us about 280 torr. So we see that the pressure decreases from its value P0 at sea level, which is about 760 to about 280. And this is approximately the height of base camp at the foot of Mount Everest. And that's why not too many people want to live up there. Uh, helicopters cannot fly there. Uh, there's just not enough air. And uh, besides the fact, it's darn cold. But even this, this value uh, for the height gives us about, uh, that's about five miles, and that underestimates the accepted uh, meteorological value for the atmospheric height by about 25%. I think the uh, accepted value is about seven miles. Okay, so, uh, oh, and uh, how do we get that? Also, we just set uh, MGY over KT equals one. That's how we got E to the minus one. And then we can solve for y because we know kt uh, in joules, and we know m, and we know g. m is a little bit uh, not so much tricky, but we have to put a little bit of uh, effort into finding it. It's the, uh, the mass and atomic mass units. In this particular case, we're using oxygen. We could have used nitrogen. We'd given more or less the same value. Oxygen and nitrogen are very similar uh, physically, they're very different, very different uh, chemically. Okay, so that's about five miles. And uh, like I say, the uh, uh, the more meteorological friendly uh, value is about uh, seven miles. So now we can uh, play with this a little bit more and we can ask the question, uh, suppose instead of oxygen, we had hydrogen. Well, hydrogen, instead of uh, an AMU of 32, it has an AMU of 2. So this value would be much, much lower, which means that Y would be much, much higher. And we would find about 120 kilometers 
instead of uh, seven kilometers. And that makes sense. I suppose it was heavier. And we did that, I believe, in, uh, in chapter one. Suppose it was argon. Well, argon is heavier. So if it was argon, we would have a smaller value for the height of the atmosphere. Uh, also, it means that the higher up we go, there's very little hydrogen, uh, more or less none, at, um, in our atmosphere. But uh, as we go higher and higher, if there was any, we would expect that value to increase. Uh, for argon, however, uh, if argon is 1% of the uh, atmosphere at sea level, we would expect it to be less than 1% uh, in the uh, as we go up higher and higher because argon is much heavier. So we expect the partial pressure of argon relative to sea level to uh, decrease. Okay, now let's look at some practical numbers, uh, specifically the mile high city of Denver, which is 1.6 uh, kilometers above sea level. So if we put in that value of y, we get from 760, we get to 604. And that's why not only does water boil at a lower temperature uh, in Denver, but it's probably prob problematic uh, for breathing. So Denver is uh, something we have to get acclimated to. And if we went to Mexico City, which is even higher, it's 2.2 kilometers, the pressure is only 550 torr. That's getting really, really low. So people in Mexico City have to, uh, have to adapt to that uh, uh, relatively low pressure. And this next paragraph, I believe, we also is a repeat of what we uh, went over in uh, in chapter one. So if we had really uh, high molecular weight gas, uh, well, gas in quotes here, uh, for viruses, uh, it would be um, just a couple of centimeters. And if we had the atmosphere, and again, this is using the word very loosely, of billiard balls, it would only be a fraction of an angstrom because the M would be absolutely humongous and the y would be reduced to uh, uh, things like 10 to the minus 10th meters or something like that but so finite all controlled by the boltzmann term right here e to the minus energy over kt um, now let's continue playing with this a little bit look at the value of g suppose now g is reduced uh, for example, we're on the moon, and in, on the moon, the gravitational acceleration is not 10 meters per second squared. It's about one-sixth of that, and that's why you can jump a lot higher uh, on the moon than you can uh, in Earth. And there, uh, the, if we're on the moon, the atmosphere would not be less. It would be lower. It would be less dense. The polar gravity is much less, but the uh, atmosphere itself, the height, as g goes down, y goes up. Instead of being about five to seven miles, depending on what definition one uses, it would be 27 miles, quite a bit more. And on the sun, uh, again, that assumes the temperature is room temperature, which is obviously uh, not a particularly brilliant assumption. Uh, but if the temperature was room temperature on a planet or something the size of the sun, then the atmosphere would only be about 250 meters. Okay, now how about the finally, let's see, uh, we look at T. As T increases, we would expect the energy of the particles to increase, and we would expect the gravity to uh, increase in height. Now that's in terms of pressure. We can also write the Boltzmann relationship for the number of or the number density of molecules. The number of molecules number, which is dimensionless, per cubic centimeter. So the dimensions here are centimeters to the minus three. The dimensions here are centimeters to the minus three. But notice this is the same term, this dimensionless term. At y equals zero, which is sea level, we can find N zero by using the ideal gas equation, PV equals nRT. 
Um, and um, R is the universal gas constant. T is the uh, room temperature. I don't know why they always use 273, which is zero degrees Celsius. It's cold, but that's what they use for room temperature. Um, and the volume uh, for one mole, if we set N equal to one mole, then V is 22.4 liters. And uh, what we're looking for, we know the pressure is a 760 torr. So we can find pretty easily, we can find a number density by noting that there are Avogadro's number of molecules in 22.4 liters. So what we have to do is convert 22.4 liters into one cubic centimeter. And uh, that's what we do here. Uh, this is uh, 22.4 liters uh, times a thousand cubic centimeters per liter. I probably should put those uh, dimensions in, but this is liters. This is cubic centimeters per liter, so liters cancel out. This is the number density in 22.4 liters. So we find, uh, without too much effort, I hope, uh, that there are about 3 times 10 to the 19th air molecules per cubic centimeter at the atmospheric pressure. Now, if you look at some of the things we'll be looking at in semiconductors, uh, that's about three orders of magnitude less than, for example, the uh, density of silicon uh, in a silicon lattice. It's approximately equal to something called NC or NV, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. Okay, but as we go up in value for y above sea level, we would expect this number to decrease. And in fact, it does. This is n0, 2.7 10, 10 to the 19th. That's at y equal to 0, and this value is equal to 1. But as y increases, this thing starts to kick in, which reduces the number density uh, rather dramatically. So that is just a few numbers here. Uh, so that Dem at Denver, it's 2.2 times 10 to the 19th, which is why uh, it's a little bit harder to breathe in Denver. It's just less, less oxygen. And Mount Everest is 1 times 10 to the 19th. So that is the really the limit of human endurance. But if you go only 30 kilometers, which uh, that's about the highest uh, plane can travel, that number goes down to 3.5 times 10 to the 17th, obviously completely incompatible with life. And a distance of only 100 kilometers, that's a distance from Philadelphia to New York, it's 10 to the 13th, a reduction of seven orders of magnitude from 10 to the 19th to 10 to the 13th. All right, six orders of magnitude, but a lot of orders of magnitude. And finally, if we increase it only to 200 kilometers, that's the distance between Baltimore and New York. That's not very high. Uh, we find it's only 10 to the 6 uh, unit uh, molecules per cc, and that is a decrease of a stunning 13 orders of magnitude. And we will see exactly the same thing when we look at the quantum distributions. So that is a non-intuitive result. You only have to go 200 kilometers to get a reduction in magnitude of 13 orders. Okay, so now let's leave the atmosphere and go into a balloon. And a balloon is described by the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And I believe historically, uh, Maxwell used the Boltzmann formulation and he added some uh, twist to make it uh, compatible with air molecules in a, um, a balloon. So the formulation is the same here, except that instead of MGY, we're going to have the energy of air in a balloon. Well, the Y is constant, so that's not going to change. We can assume that the Y uh, is approximately sea level. And the energy term, this MGY is energy, always going to be energy. So the energy term is going to be kinetic energy 
rather than gravitational energy. So, first we're going to find uh, how many molecules do you have in a balloon? Well, we're going to take uh, an average size balloon, about one liter, or about one quart, or about uh, a thousand cubic centimeters, and we're going to say that the pressure is a little bit higher than the pressure in the atmosphere, and the accepted value, I believe, is about 10%. So 10% would give a, a pressure of about 840 uh, torr rather than uh, 760 torr. So how many molecules do we have? Well, I kept it about 10 to the fifth. I probably should have put a 1.1 here. It really doesn't matter very much. Uh, the volume is 1 times 10 to the minus third cubic meters. This is everything would be cubic meters. And we want to find out how many moles uh, we have. So uh, R, of course, the universal gas constant, and uh, T is, again, to 0 degrees Celsius. So we find it's about a 0.05 moles. Uh, so if we have uh, 6 times 10 to the 23rd molecules per mole, we will have about 3 times 10 to the 22 molecules in a, um, uh, in a typical balloon. And that's about three orders of magnitude more than we would have molecules per cubic uh, centimeter. Okay, with those uh, preliminary uh, to, uh, issues, let's go back to our Boltzmann formulation. So this is what Maxwell started with. The, this some function of energy, we don't know what it is yet, is going to be equal to a constant. The units of this constant may well, better be the same as the units of this function because this is unitless. So the first question, of course, is what is what is E? Well, as we said, it's all kinetic energy. It's one half mv squared energy. So this function is a function of kinetic energy, and it's some constant multiplied by the Boltzmann term. Okay. Well, what is kinetic energy? It is one half mv squared, and there are three separate directions and three-dimensional space. So it's the x component, the y component, and the z component. And they're all independent, so we can write them uh, explicitly. And we have no dependence of this term on this term, so they're all completely independent. Now, here's the basic issue, which we may as well at least start to get out of the way right now. When we were talking about gravitational energy, the only thing we had was the Boltzmann term. And the reason that we didn't have to worry about this constant A was that the lowest state, the state with uh, zero uh, energy, which is the ground state, was also the most probable state. As we go up in Y for gravitational energy, the probability of states becoming occupied is reduced, becomes less and less. That is not the case for molecules in a balloon. In molecules in a balloon, the lowest energy state, the lowest kinetic energy state, of course, is the rest state, the state with zero kinetic energy. But that is not the most probable state. In fact, that state doesn't even exist. There are no states in a balloon where the kinetic energy is zero. If the kinetic energy of uh, all the states, for example, in the balloon was zero, the balloon would collapse. And of course, everything else would collapse in the world too. So in a balloon, and this was Maxwell's genius to figure this out, the most probable state is not the state of lowest, uh, of lowest energy. So, he writes this uh, thing like this, uh, three independent uh, velocity components, and then he breaks up the A. The A's are always going to be the same, so each one gets an A to the one-third. Uh, A to the one-third, A to the one-third, of course, which just gives A. So then he says, well, let's take a look at uh, just one term, the x-component term. And I believe this is more or less a rehash 
of uh, what we do in the Appendix A uh, in Chapter 1. So we're going to just uh, repeat it, hopefully, a little bit uh, quicker. And uh, we get um, equation 8.79. We just pull out uh, the kinetic energy of the uh, X component velocity. And this paragraph is basically just a rehash, uh, saying that the zero velocity state does not exist. Uh, it is therefore not the most probable state. Nothing, something that doesn't exist cannot be probable. So that's unlike the gravitational case. Okay. So our first task is to solve for A, and we're going to solve for it uh, just using equation A 7.9. Uh, the velocity v sub x must exist in some form. The only one that doesn't exist is zero. It can be going from left to right. It can be going from right to left. doesn't matter. Uh, but if we integrate over all of those uh, v sub x velocities, we should get a probability of 1. And that's what we do here. We take this function f, and we integrate it over all of the possible velocities. And we're claiming that since it's got to have at least one of those, uh, if we integrate, in fact, it has a lot more than one, if we integrate over all of them, we should get the fact uh, that the probability of having some velocity in the x direction is essentially a certainty. So it's going to be equal to 1. So this is a tabulated integral, which is great. Uh, here is the tabulated integral. Um, we, have, we have an a here, and it's just um, root pi over a. So we have a substitution for a, uh, the x uh, thing that we're integrating over is just uh, v. Uh, so x is equal to v, and a squared is equal to all of this stuff, m over 2kt. And we substitute that in, and we solve for a. So this is just algebra. And we get the value of uh, a to the 1 third, which is basically just this thing flipped on its side. Uh, and then we can just uh, uh, take the cube of that, and we get the value of a. So that's kind of a big deal. And now we have equation A713, which is pretty much a big step along the way. So if we go to equation A713, uh, we ask, what the heck is this thing F? Well, whatever it is, it has units of the constant A. And of course, the reason, as uh, we know all this stuff here, everything with the exponentials is unitless. So the units of f are the units of a. So let's just work out what the units of a are. Uh, we've done this before, um, so it's not that big a deal. Uh, here we have m kilograms, kt is in joules. Um, so uh, joules are uh, newton meters. and uh, one newton is one kilogram meter per second squared. Uh, that's why we have a, uh, uh, all this stuff here. Let's see, we have, this is the kilogram, and everything else is the joules. The newton is kilogram meter per second squared, but a joule is a newton meter. So that's why we have meter squared here. So we cancel out the kilograms, and we have uh, meter squared per second squared. Um, that goes away with this square root sign, so that the units of A are velocity to the minus 3 power, which means that the units of F must be velocity to the minus 3 power. Very, very strange units. So how do we get this into a probability? Somehow we've got to multiply by v cubed. And that's exactly what we uh, do here. So we write equation A713 um, in the following form. Where is it? Oh, here it is, A714. 
we write it as this constant a, which is uh, velocity to the minus 3, multiplied by some function g, which is only a function of v. And we're going to split this guy up. We're going to say that uh, g is a function of v squared. And we'll see why. Well, actually, we see why right here. Because if we say g is a function of v squared, and then we integrate uh, over all possible velocities, function f, then we should get 1 because um, we have to have a situation where there is some velocity. Uh, we just don't know what that velocity is. But to determine the function g, uh, first one is which we stated a number of times. Unlike the Boltzmann's, unlike the Boltzmann distribution for gravity, I should have put for gravity here. The lowest energy state in the uh, Maxwell. Uh, this should be Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Does not have the highest occupancy. Let me just make that Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Okay, as we saw in Chapter Five, uh, and we'll see again in quantum. Uh, distributions, the occupancy is the number of states multiplied by the probability of a state being occupied. This is the Boltzmann part. The probability of a state being occupied is given by that Boltzmann tail, e to the minus energy over kT. The number of states, that is this guy right here. This is what we call in uh, semiconductors the density of states. And that's what we see here. Uh, this is from chapter 5. We looked at the number of states in momentum space. We do the exact same thing in the classical sense uh, for the uh, velocities. At zero velocity, this um, essentially this sphere shrinks down to a point, and there are no velocities. And then, of course, as we move up, 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 uh, the velocity increases. The number density, the complete density of states, would be given by this uh, number of states in this shell right here, which would be given by the surface area of the sphere, which is 4 pi v squared. That would be the surface uh, of, the, uh, of the sphere of any velocity v, multiplied by dv, which is the distance of, uh, of the shell. So the volume of the shell between the red and the blue spheres is given by 4 pi v squared, the surface area multiplied by dv. So now, since we know the 4 pi that comes from here, the v squared comes from here, we stick all that stuff back into, um, uh, into here, and we get equal equation. Oh, I didn't label this, but uh, this is the basic equation right here. We can either uh, put it in terms of kT or rT. They are both completely equivalent. Um, so we write it out in two forms. Mm -hmm. right? uh, this, is, this is our basic equation right here. And if we write it in this form, now we have a in correct interpretation for this function v. It is a probability density in velocity space. So if we integrate f of v over all velocities, we should get a value of a round number 1. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, again, we uh, just reiterate for the umpteenth time uh, these two characteristics. Um, this is the important one right now. The maximum Boltzmann distribution is a probability density, and we're going to integrate it over all velocities, and we're going to get a uh, value of 1. OK, let's see how we do that. Uh, property 3, uh, the, this function fv uh, consists of three parts. The v squared term, which is the density of states term in the quantum world, it's the number of possible states. The Boltzmann term, which is the exponentially decreasing, it tells us what the likelihood of the occupancy of that state is if it exists. And then there's a constant to ensure that the units turn out to be correct. 
Okay, so now we integrate this guy over all possible velocities from zero velocity to uh, infinity. And I said, well, is that going to be equal to one? Well, let's find out. Again, it's a tabulated uh, integral, very similar to the previous tabulated integral, except instead of a, it's got a cubed. Uh, so if you look back uh, at the uh, previous uh, tabulated integral, uh, which did not have the b squared in it, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite similar. So uh, substituting for the value of a, what is uh, a right? A is this guy right here. Uh, actually, it's, uh, oh, okay, we can use it in the RT form. It would just be m over 2RT. That's right here. And of course, we have to cube that. And then we square root. That's why it's got the 3 halves power. And everything cancels out. Life is wonderful. And indeed, we get a value of 1. So that is the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. It is Boltzmann with the added issue of the fact that the lowest energy state is not the most likely state. OK, so now we move on to quantum distributions. And quantum distributions do not involve air particles like oxygen and nitrogen. They involve either things like electrons, which follow Fermi Dirac statistics, or uh, photons, which follow uh, boson, uh, boson Einstein statistics. We are going to be mostly concerned, uh, always concerned with electrons, so we'll be following the uh, Fermi Dirac uh, statistics. And uh, Fermi Dirac electrons are just dumped into states uh, with two states per electron. I should say two electrons per state, one spin up and spin down, and then they just fill up until they get to the maximum energy level, and that is called the, uh, the Fermi level. We'll be looking at three cases here. The first uh, one will be the number density, a number per cubic centimeter of electrons in the conduction band uh, of an n-type semiconductor, or we could uh, also uh, Conversely, looking at the number density of holes in the balance band. But in both cases, it's a function uh, of the, the number is a function of the position of the, uh, of the Fermi level. And this will be in a doped semiconductor. And uh, the doping concentration, uh, as we know uh, from all of our studies, uh, determines the position of the Fermi level. Fermi level below intrinsic, P type. Fermi level above intrinsic n type. Okay, so there are two cases electrons in the conduction band, holes in the balance band. Let's take a look at both of them. These are electrons in the conduction band. Uh, the number is equal to a constant in C multiplied by some Boltzmann factor, precisely what we had in this case although a little bit different because here we have a positive uh, E sub F. E sub F is the thing that is going to change, <clears throat> just like y, y goes up. In this case, E sub F is going to go down. When E sub F is at E sub C, this term goes away, becomes 1, and N is equal to NC. So if you look at the uh, p-type case, we have uh, a number of holes in the valence band, again equal to a constant. And here we have precisely the same as the gravitational case, because we have a minus something which is going to change. This is EV is constant, just like EC is constant. So in this case, as EF goes up, just like Y goes up, then P goes down. Uh, if E sub F is equal to EV, then the number of holes is equal to NV. Okay, so uh, let's just take this case here because it's precisely analogous to the, uh, to the gravitational case. But in both cases, uh, we have a power uh, in the uh, exponential. And if that 
changes, either becomes more negative, moves down, or more positive, uh, moves up, uh, then the number of uh, either electrons or holes decrease. And that's the important thing. Exactly like the Boltzmann meter is a pure, uh, I was going to use a classical Boltzmann. It's a, it's a quantum Boltzmann, but it is classic in the sense that it behaves precisely the same way. Uh, both cases are what well, I could term Boltzmann friendly because they react in the same way. Now remember that the number of uh, air molecules, which we saw just a little while ago, can decrease by huge orders of magnitude, 13 orders of magnitude as we go from sea level to 200 kilometers. And that's only the distance from, uh, say, Baltimore to New York. We have the same thing uh, in the uh, number of electrons or number of holes in the conduction balance band. They decrease very dramatically as the Fermi level uh, moves away from the band edge. So in the case, for example, of electrons, uh, we move from about 10 to the 19th. We'll figure out that number just a little bit. Um, actually, we actually calculated it, so I won't recalculate it. It's about 10 to the 19th. So it goes from 10 to the 19th at the band edges. Same here uh, at the band edge on the balance band for p-type. Uh, the number of holes is equal to about 10 to the 19th. And as we go from the band edge to the intrinsic level, this number here, n, falls off from 10 to the 19th down to, if it's in silicon, uh, down to 10 to the 10th, or nine orders of magnitude, actually less than uh, the number of uh, air molecules in the atmosphere falls from going from, say, Baltimore to New York. Here it falls 13 orders of magnitude. Here it only, only falls 10 orders of magnitude. Okay, so that's basically uh, all I'm saying here. Again, this 10 to the 10th is for uh, silicon. If it's a higher band gap material, uh, then this number would even be much lower, as we'll see in just a little bit. Okay, so that is the third uh, distribution, uh, first one, first quantum distribution. And the next one we're going to look at, the fourth one, is the intrinsic carrier concentration for electron hole pairs as a function of the material band gap, e.g. Okay, so if you look at the intrinsic carrier concentration, uh, this is equation 4.2, and here again we have almost precisely the same formulation as in the Boltzmann uh, distribution. We have a, a, uh, a number, uh, in this case it's going to be the intrinsic value, which is a function, or it's equal to a constant value multiplied by a Boltzmann uh, factor. So, EG is the band gap, and M is the effective mass. Now, the fact that we have uh, Planck's constant should give us a hint that, well, should tell us really, not a hint. It tells us that this is a quantum distribution and not a classical distribution. Let's look at the value uh, or the units of this constant. Since this is unitless, which we've said too many times, I think, we certainly know that by now, uh, the units of this constant must be a centimeter to the minus three. And let's see if that's true. M is the effective mass in kilograms. Here, uh, KT is in joules. And all of this stuff on the bottom, uh, which is squared, is the uh, Planck's constant squared. Now, the, the units of Planck constant are action, action which is uh, momentum multiplied by distance. Momentum is mv. Uh, this is the v part, uh, v velocity, centimeters per second, m kilograms. So this is momentum multiplied by distance and all of that. Uh, squared. So if we just do the algebra, we bring uh, uh, pretty 
pretty straightforward. Let's see. Uh, and the kilograms cancel and all, all these things cancel on the centimeters. Uh, centimeters squared cancel here, centimeters squared. And we're left with uh, centimeters squared on the bottom. Um, and that's the 3 halves power. And we get uh, centimeters to the minus 3 exactly as we would have uh, hoped for or expected, as the case may be, depending on whether one is an optimist or a pessimist. I would say that expected, because I'm an optimist. So if we put in the values for m, k, t, and h, which is a mess, but we did it. We did it in, I believe, chapter 5. Uh, we find it's about 3 times in the 19th, uh, slightly lower for uh, slightly lower for holes, and uh, I'm sorry, slightly higher uh, for a hole slightly lower for electrons because the electron effective mass is somewhat less. Uh, so that uh, gives it. But anyway, it's about 10 to the 19th. So what it means is that for EG equal to zero, the number of electron hole pairs is about 10 to the 19th. As EG increases in value, then this number becomes really, really small, which drags the number of intrinsic electrons, uh, electron hole pairs, lower. So EG equals 0, 10 to the 19th. If EG is 1.1, uh, for silicon, we get 10 to the 10th. If it's 0.67, for germanium, we get 10 to the 13th. And if it is um, gallium arsenide, which is 1.45, it's only 10 to the 7th. So that's about a 12 order of magnitude uh, decrease. So uh, we're, we're cool with that because uh, we only saw 13 orders of magnitude uh, for the number of air molecules in the atmosphere. But look what happens if it's talking about silicon carbide or gallium nitride, which is on the order of 3 EV for 3 EV the uh, concentration goes to 10 to the minus 6. That's not a typo. I make enough typos. This is not a typo. This is 10 to the minus 6 per cubic centimeter. And that is a stunning 25 orders of magnitude uh, reduction. Absolutely uh, breathtaking. OK, so for both uh, numbers 3 and number 4, uh, those were classical Boltzmann. Number five asks the question, how are electrons or holes distributed in the conduction or valence band? Are they both at the edges? Or are they distributed uniformly? Um, that's exactly the question that we asked with uh, the number of holes, uh, the number of the number of holes, the number of air molecules in a uh, in a balloon. So remember, air molecules in a balloon, we have the number of uh, different velocity states multiplied by the probability of the state being occupied. And uh, we found that uh, the number of states, uh, or the number of possible velocities, uh, varies rather dramatically. In fact, there were no uh, velocities at zero. Uh, the, the, um, the number of velocity states increased as the velocity went up. But the probability of those states being occupied decreased as the velocity went up. And we found that the uh, most probable state, uh, we'll see that at the end, is about, uh, I should say, the most probable velocity is just a little bit more than the speed of uh, sound uh, in air. So it's exactly the same thing for the distribution of electrons or holes in the uh, in the bands. Okay, there are no states. It works out at E C, and as the energy increases, the number of states increases, but their probability of occupancy decreases, and the energy as we move above. The conduction band is all kinetic energy. So that's exactly what we're saying here. As the energy rises in the conduction band, the density of states in increases, but their probability 
decreases right here. That's the probability. It decreases uh, just as Boltzmann says. So it's basically like a maximal Boltzmann distribution. So we should have a most probable point in energy, and that most probable point is kT. And if you work, uh, if you look at problem six, six point six, six point um, eight. Uh, we discuss that in a little more detail. Just like the most probable probable uh, velocity is, uh, we can find very easily by differentiating the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, setting the derivative to zero, and we find this is the most probable uh, velocity, which again is about 400 or so meters per second. So that's it. Five distributions, two classical, two quantum mechanical, uh, three quantum mechanical, but they all follow the same form right here, Boltzmann. Energy divided by kT. And that is pretty neat. So Boltzmann showed us the way on how to uh, look at distributions, whether or not they're classical or quantum mechanical. They're all Boltzmann.